Uh, good afternoon. <laughs> Thank you, Dorothy. Uh, so, from the realm of big ideas with Alan to the gross empirical of Shepard, I'm afraid. This is an empirical question, primarily. Uh, so, many of you know about the 1918 influenza epidemic. It's reputedly uh, killed from 50 to 100 million people around the globe. It's a, you know, spikes in the death rate in every country around the world uh, in 1918, in the fall of 1918. Uh, there has been some uh, revival of the question as to whether the pandemic originated in China in some recent literature. Uh, so I want to discuss that and uh, address and criticize it. Uh, so it began in the spring of 1918 when, uh, you know, particularly uh, prevalent, uh, you know, seasonal flu, uh, you know, began to spread, uh, you know, uh, very quickly around the world, uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, may have started in the U.S. Midwest uh, among army camps. Again, uh, the U.S. Army was, you know, preparing to train a lot of young men uh, to go to France to engage in the front uh, during World War uh, One. Uh, but then in the fall of 1918, uh, there was a second wave of a very virulent strain of influenza uh, that uh, broke out in France and then again began to spread around the world. But this influenza was much more deadly and you know, the death rates uh, climbed and that's what gets us to this uh, estimate of 50 to 100 million deaths uh, you know, by the end of uh, uh, the second wave. Uh, the sort of standard uh, story of the influenza, and one that was recently, well, not that recently now, maybe in 2004, 2005, a man named John Barry uh, published a very popular book called The Great Influenza uh, that was widely read uh, and spurred, again, you know, additional in interest in the history of the 1918 influenza. So you can see that this map. Uh, you know, compiled by some uh, in, you know, uh, scholars interested in the history of influenza epidemics, of which there have been many uh, well recorded in the last couple of centuries. Uh, uh, you know, they're tracing uh, uh, an origin point from somewhere in the Midwest in the United States uh, uh, and then an outward diffusion. So that's the first wave, the spring wave, and then the fall wave you can see. Uh, in, uh, in France, there it's, uh, there's a one there, and it uh, looks like Portugal, uh, also in the, the west coast of Africa. Uh, you know, in August uh, beginnings, and then uh, further worldwide spread, uh, you know, reaching very quickly across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, uh, you know, around the Horn of Africa. Uh, so, uh, you know, their diffusion maps represent what I would say is uh, the current scholarly uh, consensus. But there's always been dissenting views about how the epidemic originated. Uh, and one of these views, compounded by Oxford, a, a British uh, uh, medical uh, professional, uh, argues that the strain started in British camps. He has some records uh, you know, that suggest an unusual a form of influenza began uh, to spread among uh, British soldiers uh, as early as 1916 in France. Uh, but there's always been a, a minority view uh, at, you know, a lot of long standing ever since 1927 when some initial uh, reviews of you know, the overall epidemic uh, were written uh, that the influenza originated in China. Uh, and this has been more recently revived by, well, <laughs> 14 years late, but 2005, uh, um, an article in a very prominent uh, journal, uh, Population and Development Reviews, publishes a lot of historical demographic uh, uh, articles uh, you know, by a well respected demographer, uh, Christopher Langer, although clearly not a China specialist, uh, uh, propounded a view. Uh, that the epidemic started in China. Now, there are a number of reasons why China is a good candidate for the beginning of an uh, influenza epidemic. Uh, 
And you know, more recently, we have the 1957 Asian flu, the 1968 Hong Kong flu. These are you know, pandemics that originated in East Asia and reportedly China uh, and you know, caused uh, you know, widespread sickness and large numbers of deaths when the global total was added up. Uh, and also, the current concern with uh, you know, the emergence of uh, new diseases, especially bird flu, a avian flu, uh, uh, also uh, finds China uh, a good candidate for the origin of these kinds of uh, new flu strains. Uh, you know, every fall we have to get a new flu shot because basically the flu in, uh, virus is very unstable. And it's constantly changing and different viruses or different strains are, you know, uh, prominent you know, from year to year. So you always need a new shot. <laughs> uh, and hopefully they, you know, guess right as to which strain uh, may be uh, the one that, uh, you know, that you, you can be protected from. Uh, so modern virology, you know, uh, talks about uh, both the, the small mutations in the influenza virus, uh, and, but also uh, what's called reassortment or large shifts can suddenly occur in you know, the prevalent uh, flu viruses. Uh, that's because the, the flu virus has sort of well, eight uh, segments to its uh, you know, RNA, DNA uh, components, and uh, sometimes an entire segment, rather than a simple mutation, but an entire segment is uh, switched out and combined with a different strain, with segments from a different strain. Uh, and uh, it's thought that, you know, this mixing of flu strains, uh, human, uh, you know, flu, uh, swine flu, avian flu, uh, these are all uh, you know, versions of the flu virus that uh, you know, can intermix and you know, spread you know, from, or cross over from species to species. Uh, and the kind of farming that's practiced in Southeast China and also Southeast Asia uh, is of the sort uh, you know, uh, that raises pigs, ducks, uh, and humans in close proximity to one another. So you've got, you know, <laughs> three species <coughs> interacting on these small farms uh, and potentially, uh, you know, that would be the source of a novel flu virus that, you know, might start uh, uh, the next pandemic. Uh, and this is especially worrisome uh, uh, in the case of uh, avian influenza where new, new strains have emerged in the, the last decade or two. Uh, that have been tracked and have been uh, rather deadly for the individuals who've contracted them. So you get the, you know, uh, Hong Kong and, uh, a couple decades ago, and uh, you, know, you get these various reports at times of uh, the need to uh, clear out the live animal markets, uh, to clean, uh, you know, all the, the poultry out of uh, these markets in Hong Kong or in other cities, Shanghai uh, and, and South China, uh, in order to suppress uh, the possible spread of an avian flu uh, that seems to be capable of uh, jumping into uh, the human population. So there you can see that you know, bird flu is a major concern for, uh, among influenza specialists today. Uh, and you can see the sort of uh, connections that they worry about uh, and the possibility that this resorting uh, will take place. Uh, so, you know, that makes China a, a real possibility for the emergence of novel flu uh, uh, viruses. And here are some pictures of foreign pigeons and ducks, pigs, and humans, uh, you know, all in close proximity to one another. Uh, which sort of is thought to increase this possibility of uh, research. Uh, now, uh, so, you know, that makes China a credible uh, uh, claim for you know, the origin of the 1918 epidemic. Uh, <clears throat> but 
uh, Langford's article and uh, previous uh, you know, scholars on whom he's basing some of his work uh, have always thought that it's peculiarly uh, it's peculiar that uh, you know reports of the influenza that we got from some missionary medical missionaries and others uh, in 1918 seem to uh, indicate that the impact of the uh, uh, flu and the pandemic was particularly mild in China, which raises the question, you know, why would it be mild? Why would the Chinese be uh, seemingly immune to an influenza virus that everywhere in the world is causing a large number of deaths? Uh, and Langford attempted to document this in this article did for the 1918-19 influenza pandemic originally uh, in China, again published in this a very prominent uh, journal uh, among the biographers. So what Langford did was uh, you know, construct a systematic uh, as he could of cause of death reports, vital statistics reports from Shanghai and Hong Kong, two important uh, you know, enclaves where uh, you know, Westerners or British uh, systems of vital statistics reporting had been established. Uh, and uh, then also uh, he collected anecdotal reports from the customs trade reports, which there were something like 45 treaty ports uh, all over China. Uh, there were uh, you know, customs officers posted in those treaty ports. Uh, and in some of these reports, they mentioned the impact of the epidemic and whether you know, it was mild or, or virulent or you know, did it disrupt business, things like that. Um, so, uh, on the basis of you know, this body of evidence, uh, Langford uh, concludes that, you know, as you can see, influence was widespread in China, um, although it appears to have been severe in some parts, uh, in many places it was mild. So you get this idea that, well, the Chinese are somehow uh, immune or protective against uh, the, uh, you know, this very influenza virus that's spreading around the world. Uh, so, rather elaborate uh, explanations for why it might be mild that way for pre-cops. Uh, so he hypothesizes that there was a precursor virus uh, spreading in China, you know, maybe in 1917, uh, that uh, many Chinese fell victim to, uh, and but in doing so, they became you know the beneficiaries of acquired immunity against this virus. Uh, and then, uh, because there are Chinese workers, uh, something called the Chinese Labor Corps, they're being recruited in Shandong primarily uh, to go to Europe. Uh, to uh, you know, do uh, you know, sort of logistical and you know, sort of beyond behind the front kind of work, building you know transport and uh, you know all kinds of things that uh, you know, all of the the young men in uh, Europe had been mobilized for one of these armies or another, so that you know, there's a big labor shortage on the Western Front, uh, which uh, uh, you know, something like uh, uh, well over 100,000 Chinese were recruited uh, to go to Europe, including Deng Xiaoping and you know, some other famous people, uh, <laughs> uh, to participate uh, in uh, this work in uh, France. Uh, so that's the connection that Langford is able to you know, draw, and then he sees these. Uh, uh, Chinese laborers who have already acquired this immunity to a precursor virus traveling to France, introducing the virus in France, where it then becomes, or, you know, transmutes into uh, a uh, you know, virulent uh, source of the pandemic. Uh, and that said in uh, 2013, Mark Humphreys published this article sort of following up uh, on Langford to really look at the experience of Chinese labor corps with influenza uh, in uh, France. 
uh, and uh, uh, he claims that the evidence there shows also that uh, these labels were uh, only marginally affected by the spread of the influenza virus uh, uh, in that time, sort of bolstering Langford's hypothesis that you know, they've been immunized by a precursor virus. Uh, so, uh, you know, what he sees then uh, is that you know, the seed for the pandemic may have had Chinese origins um, and <clears throat> Uh, uh, you know, that's uh, how he connects uh, the European outbreak to the hypothetical uh, earlier outbreak in China. For which, by the way, I should say there's absolutely no evidence. <laughs> there's no evidence that there was some kind of influenza outbreak in 1917 or 1916, you know, of any major source that, you know, that it's purely hypothetical. Uh, so, uh, you know, one question then, uh, as I said, this is an empirical exercise, is was the impact on the Chinese population in 1918 of uh, uh, the pandemic virus uh, actually mild or not? What is his evidence for that claim? Uh, so I'm going to have to drag you into thinking about how the uh, historical partners use uh, the bottom statistics records and death certificates and cause of death statistics to uh, right at these kinds of conclusions. Uh, it's important to note that uh, viruses have not really been discovered and were not discovered until the 1930s. Uh, uh, so uh, a lot of the sort of case reports, you know, the doctors writing up uh, case reports on the basis of uh, you know, what they're seeing from people struck uh, by the influence of virus are. Uh, you know, not as precise as we would like, uh, you know, from a modern point of view in terms of, uh, you know, the symptoms that, that are recorded and noted, but, you know, uh, uh, you know not that bad. But it, we have no, you know, lab results or, uh, you know, lab samples that were preserved from 1918 that we could go back and test or learn something from. Uh, Generally, influenza in 1918, uh, the virulent form, um, you know, was sometimes an immediate cause of death. I mean, you die like you know within a few days of contracting the, the virus. But a, a lot of people had a, a somewhat longer progression of the disease, uh, and they ultimately died of pneumonia or you know some kind of severe bronchial uh, infection. Uh, so. Uh, when we looked for you know, evidence of you know, the excess number of deaths being caused by the pandemic in the cause of death statistics, we have to include all of the cause of death reports for pneumonia, bronchitis, and influenza in order to capture uh, you know, the true impact of the influenza virus. Uh, and then uh, <clears throat> We uh, calculated epidemic excess, uh, so we look back a number of years, find out what the base rate of the seasonal influenza has been, uh, subtract that out from the total uh, we get, what we get, you know, season, the base rate of PBI, the pneumonia, bronchitis, and influenza, subtract that from what we get in 1918, and then that's the epidemic excess mortality that we can pretty certainly identify as being caused by the, uh, influ the virulent influenza virus that was unleashed in 1918. Uh, a much cruder way to do this is to look at crude death rates, which is what Langford did, uh, and compare you know, several crude death rates from previous years, uh, subtract that, that out as a base rate, and see how the crude death rate, which includes all causes, uh, uh, you know, has increased uh, or not. Uh, the crude death rates, especially in a period when there are lots of infectious diseases, there's measles, there's cholera, uh, you know, there are lots of diseases that are going up, you know, appearing and disappearing from year to year. Uh, so uh, that's a very unreliable uh, index, and unfortunately that's what uh, a lot of what uh, Langford used. 
so, uh, you know, sort of methodological criticism number one is that he didn't use the right method. Uh, the other problem with 1918, and that this is the reason why people always sort of turn to China, because uh, it's it's really a black hole of you know vital statistics information. There's no central government reporting system, you know, that's been instituted and it covers the entire country. Uh, all the vital statistics information we have comes from foreign enclaves, except for the city of Beijing. Uh, and so, you know, it's very hit and miss. Uh, and, you know, given that kind of murkiness about what's actually happening in China, there's a, a lot of room for uh, people like Langford to come in and speculate uh, and hypothesize that, you know, something uh, is happening. <coughs> Langford also relied only on English reports from Shanghai and from Hong Kong uh, uh, and these other reports, uh, which are not really high quality reports from the trade reports in the post office. Uh, there's, you know, because they're, they're really not for the purpose of reporting on disease conditions, their trade conditions, and whether the trade officer thought it was important to include anything about the disease, uh, you know, was in that haphazard enough. There's another article that Langford cites uh, by Ijima, a Japanese scholar, uh, called The Spanish Influenza in China, 1918 to 20. Uh, where he, uh, you know, reviewed uh, vital statistics data from Japanese colonies or, you know, areas of control in China, uh, Guangdong, uh, not Guangdong, <laughs> but, <laughs> but uh, you know, the southern tip where uh, Dairan and Davian and Port Arthur are, and, uh, you know, in the southern part of the army or Manchuria. Uh, uh, and also uh, Taiwan, which is a new Japanese colony. But Ichima too was rather sloppy from my point of view. He did not look at you know, the annual rates. He computed a crude three-year average. He used only deaths that were actually classified as influenza, so missing all of those deaths that are caused by the, the uh, pandemic virus, uh, but are recorded as due to pneumonia or bronchitis. Uh, so, uh, you know, I think sloppy methodologies were on a part of the uh, Now, when you get a look at the Shanghai reports, yes, they're in English, but they're also garbage. <laughs> uh, so, I mean, it's really shameful, I think, that Langford uh, tried to use these things. They're okay on the foreign population, and after all, the whole system is Eurocentric and colonial, and then that was the, for the, the population that was uh, best recorded, and also, also best served by doctors who might actually fill out a cause of death you know, report. Uh, but there's actually no compulsory registration of deaths in Shanghai in this period. Uh, there's a very, you know, much larger Chinese population, some of them wealthy and well-to-do and served by, you know, reputable medical people, uh, but the great majority had no access to medical uh, services of any kind, you know, that would be making out death certificates uh, and, you know, contributing to the Shanghai International Settlement's uh, vital statistics reports. Uh, so I think it's an embarrassment, actually, to claim anything on the basis of what it says about the Chinese population uh, from these statistical reports. Uh, so, uh, so much for Sean. Uh, <laughs> uh, Hong Kong. Well, Hong Kong, the quality is generally much better, although there are recognizable deficiencies, and again, with respect to the Chinese population, uh, there are many infant births and deaths went unreported. Uh, you know, when an infant death uh, occurs you know, very early in the first days of life. Uh, basically, there's no birth certificate, there's no death certificate. It's a non-event. Uh, you know, there's no official recognition of anything at all. Uh, so uh, this is a common problem with you know, 
violence is these things. Systems that are not well, you know, institutionalized, uh, and that's uh, certainly the case here. Uh, unfortunately, and Lightfoot falls victim again to a mistake <laughs> that's made in the uh, uh, Hong Kong uh, you know, annual bias statistics reports for 1918, which is that they simply miscalculated the rate. So that gives you a mistaken view of how it compares to uh, the rate in the previous uh, years. Uh, they did so because uh, generally the, the new territories in Hong Kong, those of you who know Hong Kong, you know what I'm talking about, uh, were not covered by the death certificates in any of these years. But in 1918, the guy who was calculating these statistics included the population of the new territories even though no, there were no death reports from the new territories, including. So you just, you water down the death rate, right, by including an additional population that's actually not contributing any deaths. So, <laughs> I mean, again, uh, you know, if you look carefully, and you discover that this is an error, and if you look at the colonial reports, which is a slightly different report, you see that Someone over in that office correctly calculated the rate. Uh, and you can reconstruct uh, from these statistics how the rate is calculated and uh, confirm that, uh, in fact, the rate is much higher than the re reported rate that went for the law. Now, I, I guess I've already mentioned the deficiencies with respect to the customs trade reports and the post office reports. I mean, there, you know, it, you know, absence of evidence is not evidence of absence. <laughs> it's basically the answer. These are not reports. There were uh, customs reports, the customs medical reports that, you know, from the 1880s up until 1911 did provide uh, interesting information about health conditions in the treaty ports because they were filled out by the medical officer in the treaty port who was assigned this duty. Uh, but those reports were discontinued in 1911. Uh, the trade reports continued, uh, but uh, you know, they're being uh, filled out by customs officers, not medically trained individuals who have an interest in disease. So again, uh, garbage in, garbage out, I guess it would be pretty rude. But, uh, <laughs> uh, so, anyway. Now it turns out that if you look broadly, there are lots of you know, little <laughs> colonial enclaves that produce uh, vital statistics of you know, uh, some utility. Uh, Beijing is the one Chinese jurisdiction from which there are uh, reports of cause of death. Uh, for the British, there's also a Ray Highway, a little, you know, a little port on the north coast of Shandong, uh, the Strait Settlements, uh, you know, not China proper, but uh, a Chinese population that's in constant contact with South China, Fujian and Guangdong uh, populations living in Singapore, Malacca, and Panama, uh, going back and forth every day, so, uh, you know, close connection. The Japanese, I uh, mentioned the Guangdong East Territory and Railway Zone going up into Manchuria, Qingdao. Uh, in, in 1914, uh, you know, Qingdao, uh, the Jiaozhou uh, area around Qingdao, was a German uh, enclave. Uh, Japan <laughs> joined the Allies uh, conveniently in 1914. Uh, which gave it an excuse to occupy Qingdao and take it from the Germans. Uh, and then, uh, for those of you who know anything about the May 4th uh, movement, <laughs> they refused to give it back to China at the end of the war, and they held on until about 1921 or 1922, when the, the powers eventually forced Japan to return it to Chinese jurisdiction. So it was under some kind of military, uh, Japanese military rule during the period of the 1918 epidemic, uh, and there were, they did uh, publish five instances uh, for those years. And then of course Taiwan, uh, and also for good measure and comparative purposes, I think through Japan and Korea in my suite of uh, uh, these statistics. 
So if you separate out the colonial, you know, the, the British or the Japanese from the native Chinese in these various jurisdictions, you end up with a lot of measures, not just Hong Kong and Shanghai, but, you know, uh, quite a lot. Uh, and you can see I've given you both the, the uh, PBI, the pneumonia bronchitis influenza excess, as well as the crude death rate excess uh, for 1918 movies. Uh, in this, um, and page two is over here. Uh, and you can see that we have reference populations that are, are, are standard for what's mild or virulent is we'll take the US and the UK and uh, you know, PDI somewhere in the 30s to 40 uh, per thousand, for 10,000 uh, deaths per 10,000. Uh, if you're over that, I'll give you. Uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, strong impact in, under that mild impact. And you can see Salon, uh, or Sri Lanka, uh, is also there. But Langford had studied Salon, and, and those, are, those are decent statistics uh, for a South Asian uh, population. Uh, so it's a lot of numbers to look at. I'll just keep going here. Uh, so the PBI excess in, in North, Way Highway, Taiwan, and Strait Settlement all come in in the 60s, uh, same as Ceylon or Sri Lanka. Qingdao and Hong Kong come in lower, uh, but if you look at their crude death rates, uh, you know, it jumps up, uh, which I suggest uh, may well be the uh, you know, a result of faulty cause of death assignment. Uh, Something's going on to push their, you know, their overall death rate up. Uh, and actually, when in other tables, we don't have time to show you. If you if you look at the seasonal death rates for fall, uh, then you can see that uh, it's in the fall that you know, there's suddenly excess death, and that's when the flu, you know, the virulent flu pandemic uh, was uh, taking its toll. Uh, so, uh, you know, I I think. There's evidence from Chinyao and Hong Kong as well that uh, you know, Chinese were hit more severely than the US and UK populations. Take that as a standard. The Strait Settlements also uh, 60 for the PBI excess death rate. Uh, and you know, as I've said, that, that's a population. I mean, if, if, there's a, if South China is the origin of a precursor virus, then it had to have gotten to this, this, the straight settlements. And if the straight settlements, which have very decent uh, vital statistics, are coming in at 60, then, uh, you know, for South China, where we have in like Hong Kong, uh, uh, then, you know, I think <laughs> we've got good reason to think that there is no such precursor immunity uh, operating. And similarly, uh, Shandong as the source of most of the Chinese labor core. Uh, we've got, you know, Qinghai Wei Highway, uh, Guangdong, I mean, the Shandong, uh, as you know, many of you know, is the source of hundreds of thousands of Chinese who are going back and forth to Manchuria every year in this period. And ultimately, you know, many of them are settling in Manchuria. So they're going through Guangdong and up the railroad into, you know, Hebron, Java, up to the Siberia. Uh, uh, so, uh, when you actually start digging into the evidence, there's lots of evidence that just is a very heavy toll uh, uh, in the Chinese uh, population, not an extraordinarily mild one. Uh, so, uh, uh, basically, I think we can reject Langford's hypothesis of the precursor virus. Uh, conferring any kind of immunity on the Chinese population. Uh, if we look, and I've gone to look more carefully at the records of the Chinese labor corps, uh, there were war diaries from various hospitals. There were a couple of hospitals that were dedicated uh, to treating the Chinese labor corps, set up by the British. Uh, you can read the case report, or the, you know, the death reports things of that nature, uh, and you know, there's 
good evidence there that the Chinese labor corn was also affected by the fall uh, you know, for, uh, virus. Uh, both the spring and, and then uh, the late fall and winter virus. It, the pandemic actually went into the winter of 1919, uh, January, February. So that gets us back to this sort of game of, you know, well, you know, you know, we have some idea that the Chinese population is a huge you know, demographic presence in Asia. It's maybe 450 million people uh, in this time. Ichima had lowballed uh, because of, again, what I consider a sloppy work. Uh, a total you know, estimate of maybe 1 to 1.2 million. Uh, Chinese killed by the influenza epidemic. Patterson and Pyle, uh, looking at the tremendous mortality in India, which you can see is estimated 17 million. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, sort of triangulating some reports, uh, you know, came up with uh, a wide range of 4 to 9.5 million uh, killed in China. Uh, if I use the 60, uh, you know, excess death for 10,000, I get an you know, uh, uh, estimate of 2.6 million, uh, you know, a population of 450 million, something like that. And uh, <clears throat> again, uh, I didn't look up what the excess death rate must be that, uh, you know, mills and uh, <clears throat> Other demographers of India have uh, calculated, but the the impact on the Indian population is tremendous uh, and much more severe than on the Chinese population. And that's always been a question, I think, in the back of the mind of many people: is you know what made the Indians so much more vulnerable? And you see this also in the Strait settlements and in the Malay states, where you also you have statistics that distinguish the Chinese from the Indians, from the Europeans, from the Malays. And you can see extremely high rates in the Indian population, with you know, uh, lower rates than in the Chinese, Malays, and Europeans. Uh, so I think uh, if there's a real puzzle about the impact of the 1918 uh, influenza epidemic on Asian populations, the puzzle is in India. Why are the Indians so vulnerable? and generating these huge mortality totals uh, you know, Chinese, Japanese, and others are uh, certainly they're hit, but uh, you know, it's, it's not a, as extreme as in India. Uh, so, uh, I think that's enough conclusions for <laughs> <laughs> so. I think uh, John is happy to take some questions, yeah. right? So where did the pandemic start? <laughs> well, it just seems to be, um, you know, in, in France. Uh, but probably in among, among U.S. soldiers. So, I mean, it, you know, that, that seems to be, you know, the consensus theory. You know, in the early scholars, uh, they did start in the Midwest and American soldiers took it to France. And then it mutated. I mean, clearly it's not as virulent uh, in the spring wave. So a mutation, something is happening uh, to change the virus. Uh, uh, but when you get a whole bunch of young men all together in you know, camps, you've got a concentration of individuals and you know, flu can spread very easily. Uh, and <clears throat> So if there's a mutation that, you know, <clears throat> and there are a lot of things that are interesting about the, the flu influenza, especially a, a unique sort of uh, age mortality curve. This is the W. Uh, you know, usually, uh, sorry, you got the bottom from uh, If this is age, uh, you know, at zero up to 80, uh, then you know, for most diseases, or most you know, death rates, you have a U-shaped curve where rates get high in the older ages and rates are high for very young children. These are uh, immature immune systems. These are immune systems that 
or weakening because of old age, unfortunately. Uh, <laughs> so the usual impact of you know an infectious disease is something like this. The, the impact of the uh, the nineteen eighteen influenza is something like this. It has this unusual peak uh, in the twenties and thirties. Uh, and that suggests you know, you know, that uh, you know, when this mutation took place, it, it, uh, it was particularly well suited to killing young men uh, in these battles. Uh, and indeed, a lot of them you know, died like flies. Uh, so, but uh, in other populations as well, it starts to spread and also has this there are, there are some explanations for that. Uh, and bird flu actually tends to have a similar kind of uh, uh, effect uh, you know, from uh, what's called a cytokine storm. It's, it's your immune system reacts it's so virulently to this novel uh, virus that uh, these uh, young, healthy adults have such powerful immune systems that uh, it overreacts and fills up their lungs with uh, you know, antibodies that essentially <laughs> help end up drowning to die in this situation. Do you, do you have the uh, mortality rate per 10,000 for SARS, which was like not a long ago? Oh, for SARS? Uh, not quite on this. That's pretty high, right? Actually, actually not that high. I mean, not as high as this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well, you know, you said they were healthy young men, but if you've been hanging out in the trenches for a year or so, being really, you know, run down, I would think. I don't know if that does. Well, that, you know, that. And they're yeah, sitting, as you said, they're sitting but, right next to each other. Yeah, very close to the nose. Um, you know, easy, easy trans, easy transmission. Uh, so, uh, but you know, that, most of these young guys from America, but they were very, very, very little time <laughs> in the trenches that was the Brits. Right. Uh, so, yeah. I have one and a half questions. Oh, good. Uh, so the first question is about the hypothesis. It seems that you quite convincingly, you know, bring a uh, long force hypothesis down uh, by your concrete evidence. So what's your hypothesis? Uh, you mentioned that at that period, Indian citizens are particularly vulnerable to the disease. Yes. So what's your hypothesis? New positive hypothesis about the Indian population. Uh, why? I mean, uh, what? Uh, yeah, what's your hypothesis about the Indian population? Why they are so vulnerable to the epidemic at that period? Uh, the, the the half question is about is out of curiosity. Um, <coughs> is this article published already? Had had your research been no. published already? Uh, uh, what's the response? No, I just sort of researchers. that this okay. is some. Okay. I've had one demographer read it, <laughs> encourage me to so. say that's good. Uh, what's my hypothesis about the yeah, yeah. uh, Well, basically, <laughs> I, I, that was to give to the Indian demographers to try to figure out. Uh, but uh, what evidence you, know, you do have suggests that um, the Indian standard of living was considerably worse uh, than the standard of living uh, that the Chinese population so, uh, you know, enjoyed. And you, you can see some of the differences here if you look at the difference between the, the Japanese rate in these various Japanese jurisdictions and the Chinese rate or the Korean rate. Uh, you can see that, or, or I guess on this page you've got all uh, Chinese versus Japanese, Chinese, Japanese versus Korean. Uh, 
the colonial subjects rate is always you know, maybe twice as high as the colonial masters rate in Japanese. Uh, so standard of living access to health care, uh, of course, benefited the, the colonial uh, masters and uh, you know, was less uh, beneficial for uh, the second population. So I think that you know conditions of living, nutrition, uh, access to you know, palliative care, there's no medicine that's going to cure you of influenza in 1918. Uh, but uh, at least, you know, comfortable conditions and, uh, you know, help, can help. Uh, so, uh, you know, I would suggest that that's probably operating even more powerfully among the Indian population. So. I was thinking of adding to that is that the, the British were much more efficient in getting grains, et cetera, out of England than they were practically anywhere else. Mike Davis has talked about that. Victorian Holocaust. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know how that would fit with those particular years, because that's actually a bit puzzle. But British were really good at getting Indian food out of India, and there would have been a real press on that during the war. So there may have been massive trends. Yeah, I, yeah. Where's the message? I wanted, you know, uh, you begin with the logic of the intermixture of pigs, birds, and you can see those situations anywhere, in, uh, I think China, certainly all over Southeast Asia, all over the Pacific. Um, is there an analogous situation like that for the American Midwest? I mean, certainly you're, you're dealing there with well, uh, you know, industrial scale agriculture. Well, in 1918, maybe not so industrial, but still lots of pigs and uh, humans, there's swine, you know, swine flu. Uh, there was a swine flu connection uh, to the 1918 uh, strain, so uh, that's that's in the you know it's in the background and it's discussed in books like Barry's and other people who advocated for the, the U.S. Midwest as a source of the, the, the I guess the, <laughs> the spring wave of that. Because this would have been before they had any antibiotics. For yeah, there's birds a, or anything. Well, um, well, you know, well, first of all, influenza is a virus, so you need antiviral. Yeah, Antibiotics are not going to help you, uh, and there are no antivirals. Last question. Okay, um, yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, Statistics, uh, but you know there is the China Medical Journal, and there are a lot. Of, there's a lot of uh, the North China Herald and the, and the Western language sources. But there are, you know, those have been uh, sourced, and I do include some of that stuff in the in the article that I've written. You know, with a couple of companies. So, uh, uh, 
But I think the, the job of like systematically going through <laughs> gazetteers for you know the hundred and some counties of you know, Trump and every province uh, is, is, a, is a you know project for someone else. <laughs> uh, 